When we think of Dadaism, we look at strange works of art. We don't even think that they are. Many may not appreciate it, but knowing the history of Dada, we understand how it developed from Cubism and how it influenced modern art, especially surrealism and pop art, forever. This is the story of how the war created one of the shortest and most important artistic movements in art history. In the years before World War I, Europe appeared to be losing its hold on reality. Einstein's universe seemed like science fiction. Freud's theories put reason in the grip of the unconscious, and Marx's communism aimed to turn society upside down, with the proletariat on top. The arts were also coming unglued. Schoenberg's music was atonal. Mallarmé's poems scrambled syntax and scattered words across the page, and Picasso's cubism made a hash of human anatomy. In Paris, after trying his hand at Impressionism and Cubism, Marcel Duchamp rejected all paintings because it was made for the eye, not the mind. In 1913, I had the happy idea to fasten a bicycle wheel to a kitchen stool and watch it turn, he later wrote, describing the construction he called bicycle wheel, a precursor of both kinetic and conceptual art. In 1916, German writer Hugo Ball, who had taken refuge from the war in neutral Switzerland, reflected on the state of contemporary art. The image of the human form is gradually disappearing from the painting of these times, and all objects appear only in fragments. The next step is for poetry to decide to do away with language. That same year, Ball recited just such a poem on the stage of the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. It was utter nonsense, of course, aimed at a public that seemed all too complacent about a senseless war. Politicians of all stripes had proclaimed the war a noble cause, whether it was to defend Germany's high culture, France's enlightenment, or Britain's empire. Ball wanted to shock anyone, he wrote, who regarded all this civilized carnage as a triumph of European intelligence. One cabaret Voltaire performer, Romanian artist Tristan Tsara, described its nightly shows as explosions of elective imbecility. This new irrational art movement would be named Dada, it got its name, according to Richard Hulsenbeck, when he and Ball came upon the word in a French-German dictionary. To Ball, it fit. Dada means yes in Romanian, or rocking horse in French, he noted in his diary. Zara, quickly used it on posters, put out the first Dada journal, and wrote one of the first of many Dada manifestos, few of which, appropriately enough, made much sense. The movement would prove to be one of the most influential in modern art foreshadowing abstract and conceptual art, performance art, pop, and installation art. But Dada would die out in less than a decade and has not had the kind of major museum retrospective it deserves until now. Dickerman traces Dada's origins to the First World War, which left 10 million dead and some 20 million wounded, confused so many of the clearest intelligence, or so thoroughly debased what is highest. Dada embraced and parodied that confusion, wished to replace the logical nonsense of the men of today with an illogical nonsense. Francis Picabaya once tacked a stuffed monkey to a board and called it a portrait of Cezanne. Total pandemonium, wrote Hans Arp of the goings-on at the gaudy, motley, overcrowded cabaret Voltaire. Zara is wiggling his behind like the belly of an oriental dancer. Janko is playing an invisible violin and bowing and scraping. Madame Hennings, with a Madonna's face, is doing the splits. Hulsenbeck is banging non-stop on the great drum, with Ball accompanying him on the piano, pale as a chalky ghost. These antics struck the Dada crowd as no more absurd than the war itself. It was not only the war, but the impact of modern media and the emerging industrial age of science and technology that provoked the Dada artists. Today, a man is only a tiny button on a giant senseless machine. The Dadas mocked that dehumanization with elaborate pseudo-diagrams that explained nothing. Arp created abstract compositions from cut-out paper shapes, which he dropped randomly onto a background and glued down where they fell. He argued for this kind of chance abstraction as a way to rid art of any subjectivity. Duchamp found a different way to make his art impersonal, drawing like a mechanical engineer rather than an artist. He preferred mechanical drawing, he said, because it's outside all pictorial convention. When Dadaists did choose to represent the human form, it was often mutilated or made to look manufactured or mechanical. The multitude of severely crippled veterans and the growth of a prosthetics industry struck contemporaries as creating a race of half-mechanical men. Duchamp probably had the most success turning the tools of science into art. 
Born near Rouen in 1887, he had grown up in a bourgeois family that encouraged art. His early paintings were influenced by Manet, Matisse, and Picasso, but his nude descending a staircase number two was entirely his own. In the painting, the female nude figure seems to take on the anatomy of a machine. Rejected by the jury for the Salon des Indépendances of 1912 in Paris, the painting created a sensation in America when it was exhibited in New York City at the 1913 Armory Show, the country's first large-scale international exposition of modern art. Two years after the show, Duchamp and Picabia left Paris for Manhattan. Duchamp filled his studio with store-bought objects that he called ready-mades, a snow shovel, a hat rack, a metal dog comb. He explained, you have to approach something with an indifference as if you had no aesthetic emotion. The choice of ready-made is always based on visual indifference and, at the same time, on the total absence of good or bad taste. Duchamp didn't exhibit his ready-made at first, but he saw in them yet another way to undermine conventional ideas about art. In 1917, he bought a porcelain urinal at a Fifth Avenue plumbing supply shop, titled it Fountain, signed it R. Mutt, and submitted it to a Society of Independent Artists exhibition in New York City. Some of the show's organizers were aghast. The ensuing publicity helped make Fountain one of Dada's most notorious symbols, along with the print of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa the following year, to which Duchamp had added a penciled mustache and goatee. Parodying the scientific method, Duchamp made voluminous notes, diagrams, and studies for his most enigmatic work, The Bride Stripped Bear, by her bachelors, even, or The Large Glass, a nine-foot-tall assemblage of metal foil, wires, oil, varnish, and dust, sandwiched between glass panels. Art historian Michael Taylor describes the work as a complex allegory of frustrated desire in which the nine uniformed bachelors in the lower panel are perpetually thwarted from copulating with the wasp-like biomechanical bride above. Duchamp's irreverence towards science was shared by two of his New York companions, Picabia and a young American photographer, Man Ray. Picabia could draw with the precision of a commercial artist making his nonsensical diagrams seem particularly convincing. Picabia covered canvases with disorienting stripes and concentric circles. Man Ray, whose photographs documented Duchamp's optical machines, put his stamp on photography by manipulating images in the darkroom to create illusions on film. In Berlin, artist Hannah Huch gave an ironic domestic touch to Dada with collages that incorporated sewing patterns, cut-up photographs taken from fashion magazines, and images of a German military and industrial society in ruins. Kurt Schwitters began making art out of the detritus of post-war Germany. He wrote of the trash he picked up off the streets and turned into collages and sculptural assemblages, the freeform construction built out of found objects and geometric forms that the artist called the Merzbau began as a couple of three-dimensional collages, or assemblages, and grew until his house had become a construction site of columns, niches, and grottos. Dada's last hurrah was sounded in Paris in the early 1920s. The movement was falling apart. The French critic and poet André Breton was already hatching the next great avant-garde idea, surrealism. But Dada, who wasn't quite dead yet, would soon leap from the grave. Arp's abstractions, Schwitter's constructions, Picabia's targets and stripes, and Duchamp's ready-mades were soon turning up in the work of major 20th century artists and art movements, from Stuart Davis's abstractions to Andy Warhol's pop art, from Jasper John's targets and flags to Robert Rauschenberg's collages and combines. Almost anywhere you look in modern and contemporary art, Dada did it first.